Hi and welcome back to a new video. Today we want to check out this Aryan motherboard with a mobile CPU on it. In detail a Q1HY CPU which doesn't have any further naming but it is very close to a 3900HK. And a 3900HK just by the naming you could imply that it's very close to a 3900K which it's not but just if you compare the core configuration, it is very close to a 13600K or a 14600K. And all that came at a price of $290. And that is at least cheaper than getting a 14600K plus a motherboard. And typically with those engineering sample CPUs, they are often unlocked. And I just wanna see, because it also has a vapor chamber, it's an interesting design. I wanna see what we can do with that. You surely saw the Seasonic MacFlow fans in one of my videos before. Seasonic also offers them in an ARGB version. With a different fan blade design, RGB inside the frame and also subtle RGB in the center, these fans focus on both design and performance. The MacFlow ARGB are also daisy chainable and can easily be expanded and connected by the integrated magnets that couple the fans without additional clips or tools. Seasonic also includes a small RGB controller if you want to avoid annoying software issues. Find out more in the link below. As I said before, when it comes to the core configuration, this CPU has 6P and 8E cores, which makes it close to a 14600K, but there are also features that take it further away. For example, the PCIe configuration. This CPU has only eight PCIe lanes. It's Gen 5, but I mean, we don't have Gen 5 GPUs yet, at least at the time of shooting this video. So you will have a small performance penalty just by having less PCIe lanes versus the desktop CPU. But there are also benefits, and at least if we compare it to desktop Raptor Lake, typically the mobile CPUs had a, it sounds maybe stupid, but slightly higher quality or better thermals at least, because the chips were thinner than desktop. That changed with Arrow Lake, but with Raptor Lake, the chips of desktop were higher than on the mobile CPUs, so the mobile CPUs were typically a little bit easier to cool. It also has a different um, power configuration, so the TDP of this one is 45 watt with a PL2, so a short duration power limit of 115 watt. And that is also a lot different to the desktop CPU with the 14600K drawing typically 125 and with stock Intel air configuration it can quickly draw up to 181 or a short time duration. So yeah, just by all those factors, this is definitely worse than the desktop part, but I still found it interesting. The packaging is extremely limited, there's almost nothing inside and yeah, there's also not much useful information on it. It's, as I said before, it's the MODT, what they call mobile on desktop because it's mobile hardware adapted for desktop. It's also pretty random packaging design. I mean, it's like three percentages and this doesn't even add up to 100%, it's like 79. And also on the back, we can see aging load test, aging test up to 168 hours to ensure reliability. I mean, 168 hours, that's exactly seven days, it's one week. I'm not sure if I would consider one week of operation like long durability or reliability, but okay. And I included content, as I said, it's very limited. We have an IO shield, which is good. We have one single SATA cable, okay. And there is like a manual, which is not really a manual, it's more like, I don't know, because you can see it's listing like ATX, MATX, Mini ITX, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th gen of CPUs, so it's probably for all the different motherboards they have. The motherboard itself is quite interesting though, especially when we start looking at the CPU and what you would think is like the heat spreader. But the heat spreader on this one is a vapor chamber. You can also see it a little bit by tilting it, that it has those like pillar structures in between. The reason for that is that if we look underneath, we can see the CPU at least a little bit. It's a BGA CPU, which is normal for the mobile CPU's ball grid array, totally different from the normal desktop LGA socket where you can place the CPU inside the socket. So this one is soldered on, at least the CPU itself. And that's why they have this yeah, vapor chamber like heat spreader to make sure that the overall mounting height is comparable to desktop. So we should be able to just mount any normal AIO. The motherboard itself is kind of limited to what the CPU does. As I said before, the mobile CPUs are a little bit more limited when it comes to connectability and everything. We have two memory slots and at least they state that you can run up to 96 gigabyte with 5600. We have two times M.2. We have a mechanical X16 slot, but this is X8 5.0. And then we have X4 3.0 only. There's also a slot if you want to install a Wi-Fi module. And yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, 
this is very limited. We have audio jacks, we have 2.5G Ethernet, we have on the left and right a dual USB 2.0, then two USB, I think 3.1. And then of course we have a dual HDMI and also display port because since it's a mobile CPU, it also has an iGPU. I had to use one of the leftover SSD coolers that I have for my testing because there is no cover in this motherboard. And since it's a 5.0 SSD, it just gets too warm. I just noticed a very small, and I'm not sure if that's even important detail, the memory slots seem to be flipped like 180 degrees. You have like a shorter and a longer portion of the DDR5 DIMM. And usually if you plug a stick, you will face this side. But on this motherboard, you're facing this side. I'm not sure if this is relevant. It's just something I randomly noticed. Standby power switched on. I want to test first if I can even boot, if it detects the memory sticks. I mean, there's always some compatibility issue to be expected. And I'm also just going to run over the iGPU first. How, well, this is, why is this booting so quick? This took like five seconds to go to BIOS screen and then like already entering Windows. This is like the fastest boot I've seen in a long time. How can we have this on a like cheap Chinese motherboard but not on any normal desktop? Intel engineering CPU as expected, it just booted so quickly, no issues at all. Memory, obviously no XMP profile or anything yet, but 48 gigabyte, 4800 booted without any issue. What is interesting is that I think the temperature reporting is wrong. Well, it has to be wrong because I can see minimum of 13, 15, 16, and I have a room temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. So that's, it's physically impossible what I'm reading right here. I just updated Hardware Info to the latest version. It didn't change or fix this. We just have to keep this in mind because there's always a danger involved. First, you might think, okay, that's cool because it just looks very cold. But in reality, if the CPU is maybe 10, 15 degrees Celsius hotter, then this might lead to a defect if the thermal protection doesn't kick in at the right spot. So yeah, we have to just be careful and keep that in mind. R23 for a start, get an impression of temperature clocks, power reading, everything. Power reading is definitely different than what you would expect stock from the CPU. As you can see, PL1 is 95 and PL2 is 110. So that's already higher than what you would have stock. And we had like 90 watts on CPU package power resulting in 14,000 points on the first run. Just going to rerun this because I noticed, I'm not sure about the clocks. I mean, obviously the clocks are expected to be low with high multi-core load and this kind of like power limit, but I expected this to be a bit higher to be fully honest. The 14,000 points might not look that much, but it's not that bad. If we compare it, for example, with a 7600X that scores about 1500 points, then the 7600X is about 7% faster while consuming over 20% more in the power draw. So efficiency wise, this is not even too bad. And you have to keep in mind that we're still running 4800 on the memory. And I'm not sure like XMP surely won't work. Those are 8000 memory modules, but I think we just go to BIOS and see what's possible. The BIOS is quite interesting and it seems to have a lot of options. There is even an overclocking performance menu, which we will certainly check out. But first we go to chipset and, and the memory configuration, which also is a little bit limited. We can do some kind of XMP profile, but as you can see, the memory frequency itself is grayed out. It's 5600 only. I think that is due to Intel limiting probably the memory speed on those mobile CPUs. At least that's my assumption. It's a typical Intel thing, I would say. And also the voltage is a little bit limited, but I think, I mean, those are 8,000 modules, shouldn't be necessary, like any voltage should easily do 5,600. I'm not sure what the motherboard is doing, but maybe some kind of memory training, but at least it's not booting yet. Yeah, something seems to be not working. At least the postcode LEDs, or not postcode, but post LEDs, they're not doing anything. And you could see on the first boot, it was extremely quick. It was going through those LEDs within seconds, but now they don't even light up. So something seems to be in the BIOS that the CPU or motherboard doesn't like. I just performed a power cycle, just pulled out the ATX 24 pin connector and at least the LED is now working. Yeah, so 4800 again, memory just didn't apply. 
it doesn't seem to be related to the memory because I just applied a custom profile, which is just going to run the same profile as stock, like no change. And this also does not apply. So it's also stuck in the boot phase. Must be something else. There's progress. At least I'm now running 5200 on the memory. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any option to increase the power limit in BIOS. That's why I'm trying to use throttle stop. I increased now PL1 and PL2 to 200 watt. And I want to see if this applies. Well, at least with the simple options, it's still stuck to 95 because of PL1 dynamic and PL2 dynamic still being the same. I now selected sync MMIO and that should typically solve this kind of behavior. I'm not sure why I just jumped to like 200 watts for a second, but it seems like the constant power draw is about 130, 140 now. It's definitely higher. Also much higher constant clock on the P and E cores. And now with the open power limit, we increased the performance quite a bit to 17,000 points in R23 Multi. That was a solid performance increase. It is still far away from a 13600K or 14600K. That's like 23,000, 24,000 points. That is a good step away from this one. This one is more in the region of a 12600K. By the way, the way to get this to boot is quite interesting. So I obviously tried the typical tricks and things. And what I had to do is set everything in BIOS, go to save and exit. And after this, typically the motherboard shuts down and then tries to power back on. So once it shut down, I just pulled out the 24 pin cable. So it doesn't power back on. Then I waited a little bit, plugged it back in, just do normal start and the settings are applied. I'm not sure why it's doing that, but it's a typical thing I remembered from a different motherboard doing some weird behavior, typical overclocking, debugging, I would call it. And that's how you can typically fix out or figure out how to fix things like that. Now, the thing I want to do is disassemble everything and remove the vapor chamber and apply liquid metal because while running R23, I could notice the temperature running about 75 degrees Celsius under load. And we know the temperature reading has to be off maybe by 10 or 15 degrees Celsius. That's my assumption. And then we would already have like 85 to 90 degrees Celsius under load. And I'm not that com comfortable pulling or pushing the CPU even further than this while it might yeah, run into like 100 degrees Celsius. They definitely do not want that you're disassembling this. I mean, there's this sticker, which I probably wouldn't care about, but those weird triangle head screws Yeah, it's clearly a vapor chamber. And this could also be the limiting factor for us in the end. Once we hit saturation of the vapor chamber, so I don't know the specs of this one, but maybe if it's only for, let's say 90 watts or like 100 watts, then we won't be able to exceed this much further. Yeah, might be the limit in the end. And here we have the ES mobile CPU soldered on. If you're wondering why it's two pieces, it's just normal for those mobile CPUs. They have like on package chipset. So what you would typically, typically have on a normal desktop like down here, it's just soldered on the same package to save space and just keep it more universal for mobile. So that's normal. And Q1HY is listing the ES sticker on the bottom. Forty ninety on that one, yeah, it looks a bit lost, I have to say. And again, it's booting incredibly fast. It's been a while that I've seen a mainboard that boots this quick. Either the liquid metal just magically fixed the temperature reading or the contact is pretty bad. It seems to be in line though, at least under load. I'm not sure, maybe it's because I'm not running the iGPU anymore. Maybe there's a correlation between iGPU and some false temperature reading, but this looks okay. Now again with the adjusted power limit, again running 130 and randomly 200 watt, but like 50 to max 60 degrees under load. That should give us headroom now. With more testing, I managed to run 5600 on the memory. More seems not to be possible, at least like 5800 or 6000, I just can't boot. However, as you can see, I'm only running half the memory controller speed. I think this is now running gear four mode. And I think because of that, probably the speed with 5600 is even less than with 5200. In BIOS, I now push the CPU, at least in theory, to four gigahertz. We will find out if that works. Clocks are behaving a bit weird. Can see power limit exceeded. 
Uh, 180 watt, yeah, that might be the reason. It looks better with 240 power limit, at least it doesn't throttle, but I'm not sure the clock didn't really increase. At least it's not running the 40 that I set in BIOS, but it's it's drawing a lot more power. And also the result is uh, worse than before, so that didn't work out. The problem is there are a lot of options, but the majority of them are just not working or they don't help. Like. CPU overclock, you can set, for example, the max ratio, but it doesn't really do anything. And you just can't simply overclock per core or just P cores or E cores. There is no menu for that. I also tested all the obvious software that you could come up with. Also Intel XU, for example, everything is like blocked. Can't adjust anything except for the power limit itself. If we check CS2, you can see the FPS are in a playable range, average about 400, but the 1% lows are somewhere like 200. And that's also because the P cores, even in that scenario with a lot lower load than R23, they're not boosting as high. Sometimes you can see like 4.7 boost, but the majority of the cores of the P cores are always at like 4.3. After a clean run, it makes even less sense if you, for example, compare it with the 7600X, so our mobile CPU does 458 FPS on average, 216 1% low, and the 7600X just does like 600 FPS and is a lot faster. The Aryang motherboard with the 13900HK yeah, is just too expensive and there are too many problems. If you just run it stock, it kind of works fine, but the performance is not great. You're lacking, I don't know, like 20, 30% performance of what you would need to kind of justify the price of $290, it's just way too much. If it's like half the price, you could maybe argue that there is a use case for this, but at the current price and in this state, it's fine to experiment with it. And it's it's fun for me, you know, I spent a day working on this and I enjoyed playing around, debugging some stuff, but that's about it. I can't seriously recommend using any of this unless it's like super cheap and you have a very specific reason to run this. Apart from that, I probably wouldn't use it. I found another version from a different vendor that was a lot cheaper, I think like 120, I paid for a motherboard with CPU. That might be interesting, it's still on the way to me and we will definitely test it once it's here. But this one, especially at that price, it's just way too expensive, too many problems. Yeah, just can't recommend it. I hope you still enjoyed it, see you next time, bye bye.